Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Joseph Warren Society interview series with prominent authors and historians specializing in the colonial period and revolutionary America. My name is Randy Flood, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Christian Despigna, author of The Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero. Now, this presentation is brought to you by the Real American Revolution public television series and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. So, Christian, let's get things underway by introducing our guest. Thanks, Randy. Colin Nicholson of the University of Sterling is a leading expert on the imperial crisis of 1765 to 1776 on the eve of the American Revolution. He is the editor of the papers of Francis Bernard, six volumes, and the author of The Infamous Governor, Francis Bernard and the Origins of the American Revolution, published in 2001, and also articles on the Massachusetts Loyalists. Recently, he co-authored the first book-length study of the onset of the revolution through the prism of friendship. Imaginary Friendship in the American Revolution, John Adams and Jonathan Sewell, 2019. Currently, he is finishing work on the sixth volume of the Bernard Papers, which presents the official and private correspondence of Massachusetts Royal Governor Sir Francis Bernard upon his return to England in 1769 until his death in 1779, documenting his attempts to influence British colonial policy. Upon completion of the sixth volume of the Bernard Papers, Colin will commence work on a new book project examining John Adams' diplomatic mission to Great Britain in the 1780s and British attempts to undermine the independence of the fledgling United States. Colin, welcome to the show. Hello, and, and uh, nice to meet you both. And uh, yes. thank you very much for the invitation. We appreciate it. Now, let me just start with this. H how do we pronounce his last name? Is it Bernard, Bernard? Well, uh, uh, the governor himself pronounced his surname Barnard. Barnard. And I know uh, Americans pronounce it Bernard, but use whichever version you wish. It doesn't really matter. Okay. All right. I'm going to try and remember that. But let me, let's start really with the first question. And really, maybe a lot of the viewers don't really know who uh, Barnard might have been, but why have you spent so much time working on him? And, and why does he seem so significant to the story of the revolution? Well, that's a very good question. Um, why so much time and why is he so significant? Um, I think his significance was already hinted at in, in your depiction of, of my own professional work. Here is somebody who's in position, lived uh, through the revolutionary years, but in his official position was able to inform the British government about events and developments in Massachusetts and the colonies more generally. He is someone on the ground who is tasked with various official responsibilities, but the information he sent back, probably more than any other official, fed into the policy-making process and influenced the decisions that the British government took right through 1765 to 1774. It wasn't the only source of information upon which they acted, but it began to inform their policy. Why so much time in Bernard? It was inescapable when, as a graduate student writing about the Massachusetts Loyalists, I couldn't avoid the governor. And he's left a treasure trove of documentation, about 4,000 bits of paper, originals, copies, and so forth. And along with Thomas Hutchinson and along with one or two other officials, they've been able to gather a real treasure trove of information about the revolution's origins. And he's probably left um, a cornucopia. It's not on a par with John Adams or Thomas Jefferson in terms of volume, but it's a rich source of, of material. And... Um, the Colonial Society of Massachusetts, uh, with whom I've worked uh, since uh, 1999, have generously funded three major projects to make available the various papers. Francis Bernard was the first, and I've been working on his papers for the last 20 years, nearly completed. Thomas Hutchinson's papers are, are now out, and they will be finished within a few years too. And there's another uh, sister project, the papers of Thomas Hul uh, Henry Halton, a commissioner of customs. So along with these officials' papers, plus the papers of Josiah Quincy, junior patriot lawyer, as, as you know, you've got a really wonderful, rich vein of material for future generations. And it will all be online, as well as in subsidized hardback copies for libraries and researchers. And that, I hope, really explains why I've been working for so long on this. Not exclusively, but it's been a real pleasure working with the society and with other scholars. Yeah. 
Well, Colin, what made the governor so controversial? He was very controversial for a period of time. And what, what made him so controversial? Again, I think that's, that's a difficult question to answer in so much as you, you could ask me that, and I'll be here for quite some time. And, and it's the problems that authors have in talking about their, their subject. Um, why was he so controversial? I think in terms of popular perceptions of colonial governors, whether it's a revolutionary period or otherwise, we tend to view them as a kind of one-dimensional uh, figure, someone who um, exhibits, let's call it, imperialistic tendencies. And Barnard was dismissive of, of colonial literature, for example. He was very much a, an anglicizer, someone who wished to, to anglicize even Harvard College as well as, uh, you know, uh, influence congregationalists in one way or another. But he, to American radicals, began to embody the notion of a conspiracy. And for American radicals, particularly James Otis and Samuel Adams, the great task in hand was to cover evidence, uncover evidence of his conspiratorial activity. They feared that he was dis deliberately engaged in disinformation, beginning to tell lies about the growth of their protests, to portray them as being not oppositional, but being revolutionary, when in reality they weren't initially. So they feared he deliberately set out to undermine their case, protecting their rights and liberties and so forth. Now, um, he didn't initially, but the reason he was so controversial is that the American radicals began to uncover what they thought was incontrovertible, incontrovertible evidence. It wasn't, but the evidence they gradually uncovered from a historian's perspective now enables me to unravel the story of his misrepresentation and the misinformation, not the disinformation, the misinformation and the misrepresentation that he projected into the imperial decision-making controversy. So he became, for American radicals, the embodiment of a rather oppressive British colonial policy. But in reality, perhaps, um, it was far more, not, not, not far more complex, but I would say far more intriguing. Francis Bernard brought the British soldiers to Boston in 1768. And there they remained until up and beyond the Boston Massacre. Francis Bernard informed the British about opposition to taxation being revolutionary. Francis Bernard described a whole series of policy proposals, options for imperial reform that included appointing directly the members of the governor's council. And all of those ideas filtered in to the decision-making process, particularly after the Boston Tea Party. And in some respects, the British began to act on those recommendations, particularly when they appointed by a writ of royal mandamus the governor's council in 1774, thus triggering the rebellion that summer. So he cast a very long shadow over British policy making, even though he left in 1769, he was still involved in decision making. And the colonists suspected that. In fact, some of them knew it. Now, um, I'll come back later if you want to talk about how his correspondence as a source was taken up by Parliament. But why was he so controversial? The colonists feared he was out to get them, and he was. Yeah, you know, and I think you did a great job in the book of really showing how his hands were really tied. He was, he was so afraid of his correspondence getting out. He was writing so many letters, hoping that they would be still shrouded in secrecy. And, you know, I, I took a quick glance at the book again. And, you know, you forget, you talk about one dimensional. And, and I forgot, I had forgotten that he had lost both his parents at an early age, and he was raised by different family members. But I think one of the most important things, and we tend to forget this, is that when he leaves Boston in 1769, the story doesn't end there. Oh, and as you point out, it, true, Christian. right, exactly. It goes on for years and years and years. But, but the question I wanted to ask you is, you know, what can the Bernard papers tell us about the onset of the revolution? Well, first, you can, you can see the portrayal of radicalization that's occurring in Boston in particular. Um, colonial um, elites would not naturally think of themselves as being political radicals. And I think your book in particular of, of Joseph Warren, you, you, could, you could say similar things about others, but not that many are rather different because I think you made the persuasive case that Warren is far more radical than others uh, early on. We don't know in some cases for sure what Samuel Adams may have thought. But um, aside from that, he's beginning to portray the body of opposition to his administration has been 
as a group that's becoming radicalized. So in that sense, we can we can trace that in the Barnard papers fairly well. James Otis is usually the um, the main target of his anger, and increasingly so Samuel Adams. A second thing I would say would be, we gather as we might expect to gather the information about the debates in public forums, in the assembly, in the town meetings and so forth. So again, it's a useful source of information for plotting that. But the third thing, I think I was struck early on by his depiction of colonial crowds and protests, notably in the Stamp Act riots. He describes the second Stamp Act riot as being an instance of a war on war of plunder. It's a very class conscious view of, of crowd action in the 18th century. And his depiction of the second riot, the destruction of Thomas's, Thomas Hutchinson's house, that arrived in London before his account of the, the milder, shall we say, riot that involved the attack on Andrew Oliver's house. And that meant that the British government was receiving these accounts not that didn't allow them a modular response. They received this emotionally driven, very dramatic depiction of a riot that led them to fear that Boston in 65 was on the verge of insurrection. And it wasn't, of course. But it even led the British cabinet um, until October, mid-October, to think about sending troops to Boston. And thankfully, they did not. But a, th a fourth point I would make is that through the 1760s, Barnard's correspondence then becomes a major source of information. Now, what he does Partly in reflection to his own, I think, uh, emotional situation, he's a beleaguered um, imperial official. He's beset from all sides, but much more than that, he sets out to craft a case for British intervention. He creates a crisis. He manages this in his correspondence, and it is profoundly influential. And you'll be able to trace this in the volumes of the Barnard Papers. Um, the Earl of Hillsborough, the American history, reacts not uncritically, and not without judgment and not without evaluation, but in short, uh, takes on board what Barnard says and responds, among other things, by sending in the soldiers. And that changes the political balance of power in Boston forever. Um, mm -hmm. So um, these are just a couple of things that I, I would consider. The last point um, really relates to what happens in England per se afterward. And while he returns in 1769, his correspondence is then presented to Parliament on several occasions. And it's used by the North Ministry to justify its American policy. Now, it's not accepted uncritically, and there are many people in Parliament who denounce the governor for manufacturing the crisis. But the sense of crisis that he projects into um, how the British will view American affairs is something that will now become influential and will continue to run through uh, British perceptions of America. Um, and we can now document all that, not for the first time, but document it comprehensively for the first time. It's a dialogue involving Barnard, the colonists and British policymakers. And it's been a lot of fun, by the way, over the years. Colin, okay. you just may have answered my last question. I was going to ask you, what's the most important takeaway from your tremendous amount of research that you've done on the governor? You know, what uh, what should viewers know and understand about him? Well, you can view a policymaker um, in London with, I suppose, some detachment now. But when you drop into Boston in 1765 and read the revolution as it's unfolding uh, and it's... Well, the early years, pre-revolutionary years, as they're unfolding, you're aware of, of the, um, the sense of isolation, the sense of crisis that this official has. He's worried on all sides. He's worried that the British are, are unresponsive. He's worried that the Americans are out to get him. And he is a governor with no real power. Governors don't have political power. All they have is influence. And they have to negotiate the imperial presence. Imperial power always has to be negotiated. And in Francis Bernard, we can see a failure to negotiate that imperial power. The colonists were not revolutionaries in 1765. And I'm not suggesting that Francis Bernard or any other official uh, provoked them to become so. Um, but we can see in his correspondence the revolution as it the pre-revolutionary years as it unfolds. It's transforming from an oppositional movement into a radical movement. And by 1774, long after he's left, 
that's a moment when in Massachusetts opposition and resistance will give way to revolution. Mm -hmm. So he deals with these first two phases, shall we say, of that process of uh, that will unfold in the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. Well, Christian yeah, Nicole, that looks like all the time we have today for the interview. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time. Well, listen, it's been an absolute pl pleasure, gentlemen, and uh, any time. Hey, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us about Governor Barnard, and uh, uh, we hope to have you back. I Anytime. know you're working on the new projects, and I'm excited to read the, about the research and your insight. And, and I, I just have to say before we go, I really think that your book filled an important void in, 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 in the history of the pre-revolution. As you, as, you, as you mentioned, this is the pre-revolution, and you really start to see things unfold in this 10-year period. So I really wanted to... Thank you for that. And, uh, you know, we hope uh, the, the viewers have enjoyed another in a series of Dr. Joseph Warren Society interviews with authors and historians. I, again, Colin, thank you so much. And I really appreciate your scholarship on this period. Thank you. And look after yourselves, gentlemen, and uh, good luck with your future endeavors. Thank hey. you. Well, folks, on behalf Pleasure. of Christian the Stigma, myself, and Colin Nicholson, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you next time on the Dr. Joseph Warren Society interviews. All right. I press the Zoom button leave now.